Oh. I take it you've been to Building 9 and looked at the space station lockups, and then you're probably over in Building 7 looking at the altitude chamber, the point chamber over there. So there's a stop three and looking at pretend spacecraft. Uh, but the first thing you guys all get a big effort timing today because uh, behind you is where we work the Morpheus project. Are you all familiar with Morpheus? This is a lunar lander um, and it's an actual flying spacecraft. Um, these guys have you know, been doing tether tests, but they took it down to Kennedy Space Center uh, just a few days ago where he's doing his first tether test today. So it's, it's been around here flying and uh, you can really see it over here, all the people crowding around it and trying to work everything. But now there's a quiet over there right now. You see the video back behind me there. And they've got a running loop to show you what Morpheus and uh, what they're doing with it. And the idea is that they're looking to see if they can make a lander that runs on methane fuel. It's actually cheaper to operate, and in some places you can actually manufacture your own methane on the surface of places like the moon and Mars. So you're not taking some of the things like hydrogen, which is much harder to do. And they've been working on it for a few years, so it's kind of cool to see a real flying vehicle over here um, working Morpheus. So that's my plug for Morpheus. That's all the love I'm going to give him today. <laughs> <laughs> of places like the moon or Mars. So I think this is usually meant when we were looking to go back to the moon at the end of the decade, uh, you know, put things out there where we're going to live for a long period of time. It was like the Apollo program where we would just put a flag down and take off. Uh, but they have rovers out there collecting up rocks and doing exploration. Uh, we have you know, power generation and finally a place to go and do things like triage rocks, see what, think, see what rocks are worth spending the time and effort to bring off the surface of the moon with, with, with scant fuel we've got. And a place for guys just to you know, get a shower and, and, and use the bathroom after being out in the road all day getting grungy in their suits. So the whole project we have is called Advanced Exploration Systems. Uh, so we've got the, the big thundering rockets. I'm sure you've heard about SLS and we've also you know, things like this Orion capsule. Um, but we've got all the called the accessories. You know, even Barbie isn't going without her accessories. So you need things like rovers, you need landers, you need habitats, uh, you need power generation. And that's all been lumped under a thing called Advanced Exploration Systems, and that's what we work on here. And my part of it is the Deep Space Habitat. So we got this all up and running. We took it out. And you'll see pictures of us out in the deserts of northern Arizona and other spots out there looking at the surface of the moon. And then we had a change of presidential administration. They said we're not going to the surface or anything except an asteroid where there's no gravity. So this thing's all built with living in gravity. Uh, right now we're making our best to work to pretend that we're in, non, in, in zero G, in microgravity. Uh, we've got other plans right now. If you look at the 20-foot chamber, I think they talked about the plans to put a habitat in there. That's, that's where our project goes. This time next year, um, we strip this out and put it in there, and that's much more like what we use in, in, in trans in space itself as opposed to being on the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars. So that's where we're going next. We've got one last test to do here in about a month. I'll be living in here for about two weeks. I'm giving it wow. to this <laughs> last thing yet. Uh, uh, and it, it, it's actually, it's a very, it's, 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 you'll see it's not very spacious. Uh, but it does have all the amenities at home for that, and so it's not bad. Mm -hmm. and so these guys have lived in there for days at a time before, and so you'll, you'll, you'll get probably a few weeks at a time before this whole thing. But the whole point is we're not, this isn't going to be a deep space, space habitat. This isn't what we're actually going to put in the surface of, of any planet. Uh, we're bringing a 20-foot chamber, obviously, is going to get uprooted out of there and spent. We don't really build deep space habitat. What we do is we look at all of NASA's missions out there, like whether they're going to the asteroids, going to Mars, going to the Moon, and we figure out, okay, what parts of those missions require habitat basically what does a habitat supposed to do? Uh, so you know, aside from keeping you alive, you need to be able to work there, you gotta sleep there, you need to communicate, do all things that you do in normal everyday living. So it's the same as if you're, if you're in a home builder, what's your house got to be, how many square feet all does your house have to be to do everything you want to get done. <coughs> when we have that, all the people who don't design subsystems, power systems, life support systems, communication systems, they come to us and go, well what do we have to build? How much power does our transmitter have to have? How much um, you know, air does our life support system have to scrub? How much water do you need to have? And we give all those requirements to them, and then they come and build prototypes, and then we test them here. And then once that's all done, we go, yeah, barely, we have a good concept for a habitation system. Oftentimes we'll have new technologies out there, what I call the technology sandbox, where you go out and play with new things. One thing we're looking at there is, is converted, um, an old, uh, well, it's an old, but a, a 
the next system into an eye tracker where I can look and see where the person is doing a robotics test, where is he looking, uh, so I can see what parts of the screen are most important. Um, are we working the person too hard? Can we redesign our display so they work less? So there's a lot of new technologies out there that aren't quite ready for prime time. Uh, so sometimes our job is to bring them along, uh, to mature them so they're ready. So when a project manager wants to really build a deep space habitat, and he's going, I'm not going to develop this from scratch. I can say this has already been built. All you got to do is take it and plug it into your system and it works and make this plug in place possible. And that's really the ultimate thing we do with our particular project. So if so we just come up with the pieces that you can put into each space habitat and we tell them how to use them. And so you got to go build them. It's all set there for you. <coughs> so this particular deep space habitat is designed for the surface. We're taking it out there. So the main part was this, this central bottom floor here. It's called the pressurized excursion module. If you look right behind you on this poster here, you can see that was designed to be able to run along behind rovers on the surface of the moon. So we've got these rovers. Make sure they get, they get to see the rovers, the SEVs. Okay. The rovers kind of scoot along, they pick up rocks, do all these fine things, and if they don't come back to the nest, we bring the nest to them. We've got this big six-legged spider thing called the athlete, which this thing sits on top of, and it trundles along at pretty slow speeds, but at the end of the day, it's caught up with the rovers. They can stop and get a can of beans in the habitat, and they get back into the rovers. So it's meant to form an airtight seal between the rovers and the habitat module, and these guys unplug and go back out. Uh, the next version of it, we put airlock on the end of it there, so guys can do actual space you know, space walks out of this particular one that just happened. That's this airlock here. Uh, we've got a extra module that we're using for hygiene, so it's a place to wash up and use the bathroom, so you're not sitting in one volume with all your buddies trying to do that. And then finally, this is a place to sleep. Uh, we, we're playing with inflatable concepts, of course, we don't really want to build in something inflatable because you got to keep it inflated the whole time here on the ground. Of course you do that, it's easier to do in a vacuum. Uh, so we built something with, with just was made out of cloth material and use other structural components to keep it up and running. We won't walk through there today because we're doing a major overhaul up there and um, we want you getting splinters and dust all over you from that. Uh, so it, it's pretty Gucci though. I, I can't convince them to put nice Brazilian cherry whip swords in here. Uh, one of these days we'll get that going on. So we'll go take a peek. So I think we can get up to 12 of you in this at a time. So what I'll do is I'll take how about you give us six? I'd probably ask you to try it out a more than that. And we'll give you a quick walk through the center section and I'll take them. Okay. Is it six, right? Yeah. Give me six of us or six of Okay. Wow. It's smaller in here than it looks Yeah, it's a lot of. But when, on it and, and protection. But once you consider where it would go, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah this is cool. The other thing is to remember is if we're looking at this and, and you wouldn't be living in this, we'd be living in your rovers and other places, so this is a place where you just kind of stop and spend a few hours just to wash up and get cleaned up and get back up to your In space, you would actually use the entire volume. So it's hard to even see so that, you know, things that look like small volumes or small areas you know, on the ground get bigger in space. The shuttle cockpit, you see those mock-ups, it looks like a place that's really tight for seven people. But once you're floating, it's really, you've got, to, you've got the whole upper part here that you don't, you don't have it available to you. So, the going around from this direction, I'll go, I guess I'm the best clockwise and I get one direction. This is called the Telerobotics Workstation. Uh, we went from two screens out there last summer to this six screen beast, and we're going to test that out and see if how that works out. That's the one that's got the Connect system sitting behind it. And what we're doing with that is we will, in this particular test, we will take the flying version of the rover uh, that's going out to an asteroid and we will use that to automate, to undock it from our space vehicle and leave it to robotically go patrol the asteroid. And so we'll plan on testing it when we're up close to it, which is real-time control, uh, when we're about 50 light seconds away, so we've got about 25 light seconds, well, which has got about a 50 second time delay. Um, how does that work? You know, what kind of autonomy does it need to have? Are we going to crash into the asteroid because we're seeing things that are about, about 50 seconds old? And then finally we get back towards Earth that we've got a five minute time delay. Um, at what point does it become untenable to keep controlling that automat from remotely? When does it need to be able to be able to take over and it's going to be autonomous? Mm -hmm. uh, we're also going to use that to work some of the uh, docking and undocking of the Orion capsule. So if we're here, we're bringing up the capsule. It's a place where we do that type of preparation work and do simulation works as well. So we're controlling anything on the surface of a planet. We would use it there too, but we're not simulating the planet's surface this time. We're not. Next time we'll probably look at being above Mars, the moon, and looking back at the surface from, say, like Earth 1, L, L1 or L2. Uh, but this time we're just looking at an asteroid uh, for This door over here behind you is the hygiene module. And if that's open or not, so you can peek in there. It's, it's a bathroom. Nothing too high-tech or fancy about it. 
make you very fit. Uh, but, <laughs> but that's where you know you do your laundry, where you wash yourself up, and where you use a toilet. Uh, we don't have any fancy toilets as yet right now. We've got a couple of candidate things for next year uh, from some of the like Hamilton Sunstrand and some of their fancy bodies, and we'll go we'll put those in there and see how people work with those. And so it's a, a big interest item amongst astronauts since the toilets can have their own, we do their own version of toilet training with all this anxiety too. <laughs> Over here is called the, the GeoLab glove box, and we've got a kind of couple, combination of things in here. We've got just the regular gloves that go in here. And the, the idea is that you're on the surface of a planet, somebody brings in a candidate rock, so you'll take, you know, pick up two of everything and look important. One goes to a bag so you don't you know, screw it up with your grubby little hands. Um, but the other one you bring in here, they've got some airlocks, these little open hatches in here, and you feed them through. And then we can sit in there and triage which things are worth um, keeping on for the ride up. You can imagine we don't have a whole lot of fuel or a whole lot of extra weight to go drag things up from the surface of the Mar surface of the moon or Mars. So you really want to make sure you've got things that are really good. So find, find a diamond field. I'm guessing we'll bring up all the diamonds. Yeah. So that'll pay for our next mission. <laughs> One of the things that they're interested in this year is can they, if we're sitting in low Earth orbit with this space station afterwards, you might not be able to put all these rocks on the capsule and bring it home, but we'll bring home, uh, bring it home by way of a cargo vehicle later on. Can you still do some of the rock examination from the surface? So we're going to have a, it's like making those arcade games where you have the grappling hook, you know, go and we'll, we'll go grab rocks and turn them and look at them and chip them and do, you know, put hydrochloric acid on, the, on them in this remotely from the ground. So we're going to test out that uh, robotic hand uh, this time out. So we've got these two big monitors here to help us with that. This is also doubles as what we'll look at our timelines for the day, uh, all of our checklist procedures. Well, we do run around with iPads, and that's our main interface. Uh, we're carrying around with us. Sometimes you just want a bigger screen and an iPad, and we want that big, that big theater vision. That's what we'll use the, the bigger screens for. Uh, back there is our alternate um, docking port for the rovers, so we can put two rovers one on either side when they're docking. This will come in from. I think that table folds up in a way, otherwise it gets tough to get in and out. On that side behind you over there is the medical operations workstation that's slightly under construction. Uh, we're putting in just higher fidelity medical tools and, uh, and capabilities to go work on this one. There's also using radio frequency identification. One of the bigger problems we have on space station is figuring out where things are. Inventory and stowage is tough. You'll put something away and where is it? And there's pieces up there that have been missing for seven years. Nobody knows where they are. They're somewhere near Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, <laughs> and so the idea is that we put radio frequency identification, identification tags like Walmart keeps in their warehouses. Um, then you can just go ask the computer, it'll tell you it's in drawer 6 and, and hopefully it's not lying to you. Huh. So we're installing that, but we're also finding out that you have to do things like put radio frequency shielding so that things don't transmit into each other's volumes and things like that. So we're, we're working on that right now. We'll see how well that works. Does it save any, any space? Does it save any time for us to go locate things? Which is a very, very big deal in space station right now. Huh. It's also got a you know, place for all our medical equipment, you know, all things like AEDs and uh, We'll, we'll, we'll probably, because uh, I get to sit on the planning meetings, I'm supposed to surprise us with a few uh, medical emergency situations that we're going to go work. Uh, there's also, the big tool here is ultrasound. It gets, it's, it, that's the thing I'm finding on space. It's very, very, it's lightweight, it's pretty cheap, and it gives you lots of insights into what's going on for internal medicine, what's going on inside of somebody's body without having to hack into them, which, of course, would be very messy. And, and really big. <laughs> the airlock. I don't think there's much in here to see except it's a big open airlock. It'll be busier here in a few weeks. I'm going to bring in two big spacesuits. And the scenario we'll play this year is that these guys have been crawling around this asteroid and of course they've, they've got it dirty. They've dinged it up. And they've been just been you know, just growling around like pigs on that asteroid. So we're going to have to haul it in and, and bring it over here to our general maintenance area and uh, pull the suits apart, overhaul fans and pumps and things that we normally don't do in space. Um, just to see if we can do that. You know what happens when you've got all these little Swiss watch components and they start floating around and you <laughs> lose track of them. Uh, can we get the suit back together such that we have confidence to go outside and use it again uh, if we need to be? Uh, typically, you don't plan on doing spacewalks on a transit part, uh, but things break. You know, maybe you know, my meteoroids will hit you, hit the skin of the ship, and you got to go out and do inspections. Or just things just go, go south. So both my spacewalks are go fix things that we didn't plan on having break before I got out there. Uh, but that's this part over here. It's general maintenance workstation where anything needs to get done. You, know, you, need, you need soldering, you need sheet metal bending, uh, things that you normally you know, would plan to do in a depot, but if you are five light minutes away from Earth, you're not going to pull into the nearest port and have it done for you. So we're learning to do those particular things too. And then there's this thing here is a big crane for things that are heavy for us. You know, here in, in, on Earth G or maybe Mars G, uh, we can go pull things around this way. Uh, let's see, we've got the elevator here which moves at about glacial speeds in real life, so we actually put a ladder in its place and we just go up and down that way. Uh, 
a second. Turn this thing off. And then that's the upstairs where we've got our exercise area. I'll uh, we'll have some type of aerobic machine out here. We'll test different types of those. We'll have some type of resistive weightlifting type uh, exercise up there as well. We've got our galley up there. Um, we've got just a little dining area. We've got a projector with the crew quarters to sit above it. The little, little things have our big flat areas so you can project a screen on there. So if you want to watch the Olympics or a ball game or something like that, uh, that's what we'll be there and watch that and use that. But that's just the living space. We're kind of moving mainly for after hours when you're exercising to get you up and out of the workspace here. Um, so if you've got any questions on this, this really does. There's, there's a couple Xbox Connect things. Yes. Here. And that's going, to tra that's going to track us moving around here to see what kind of that is. They're looking, this is where we check out the human factors of things. So uh, is there some place where everybody gets jammed up in the same spot? There's a place where I'm trying to get from A to B, but I'm stuck there for two minutes because there's a lot of work on that same spot. We can figure out, okay, maybe we shouldn't put the glove.